Bells are ringing, lights are twinkling, snow is falling, and carolers are wassailing. And that can only mean one thing, it's Christmas time in Hollywood Graveyard. So throw a Yule log on the fire and cozy up next to the tree with some hot cocoa, as we set out to remember and visit the final resting places of the stars who topped our Christmas trees. Christmas has its roots in various traditions, Christian and pagan, focused around the birth of Christ and the winter solstice festivities. But the Christmas holiday we know today began to be reinvented during the Victorian era by a handful of writers and artists. It was during this period that Christmas resurged in popularity and became the family-centric holiday of peace, goodwill, nostalgia, gift-giving, and just a bit of magic that we know today. Washington Irving is best known for his contribution to Halloween, writing The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, but he also made significant contributions to the modern Christmas holiday. In 1820 he published the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, Gent. Several episodes of this serial reflect on the Christmas celebrations in an English manner. The delightful and wholesome depiction sparked a renewed interest in the Christmas holiday in both America and England. After his death in 1859, Irving was laid to rest here in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in New York. At Trinity Church Cemetery in New York, we find another writer who helped reinvent Christmas, Clement Clark Moore. He was a pastor, civic leader, and poet best remembered today for penning the beloved Christmas poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, better known as The Night Before Christmas. He originally wrote the piece to amuse his children, but they encouraged him to publish, which he did anonymously in 1823. It wasn't until 1837 that it was attributed to Moore. The poem is largely responsible for popularizing many of our modern conceptions of Christmas and Santa Claus, including his bringing gifts down the chimney, and the names of his eight tiny reindeer. Before this, views of Christmas and St. Nicholas varied considerably. Moore's poems served to focus and unify these views into what we know today. St. Nicholas was a 4th century Orthodox bishop from modern-day Turkey. He became famous for his generous gifts to the poor, and so during the Middle Ages, on December 6th, children who were good were given gifts in his honor, while those who were naughty got none. The Dutch knew him as Sinterklaas, and these traditions would become our modern-day Santa Claus. Clement Clark Moore gave us a rough physical description of the jolly old elf, but in the mid-1800s there was no real consensus of what Santa Claus looked like. And that brings us to New York's Woodlawn Cemetery and a man named Thomas Nast. He was a cartoonist for Harper's Weekly. And in a series of drawings in the 1860s through the 80s, Nast gave the world the definitive Santa Claus, round, jolly, with a long white beard, wearing a red suit and hat. Across the pond, we find another man who helped invent our modern Christmas. We're at Westminster Abbey in London, England, in a section known as Poet's Corner. This is where Charles Dickens is laid to rest. Drawing on the Christmas experiences of his own youth and the writings of Washington Irving, Charles Dickens published the novella A Christmas Carol in 1843. It's the story of the miserly Ebenezer Scrooge who undergoes a change of heart after a visit from the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, becoming a kinder man who embraces the spirit of Christmas. Dickens A Christmas Carol would be heavily influential on defining the spirit of Christmas, placing emphasis on the importance of charity and goodwill towards others, particularly the less fortunate, as a key component of the Christmas holidays. A Christmas Carol has been adapted countless times on stage, screen, in music, and more. For my money, the best film adaptation is the 1984 TV movie starring George C. Scott, who rests here in an unmarked grave at Westwood Village Memorial Park. Scott was an actor whose commanding presence and gruff imposing character made him perfect for the role of Scrooge. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding <laughs> and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. <laughs> Come now, Uncle. Neville, you keep Christmas in your way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. When filmmakers were shooting the scene in the graveyard where Scrooge discovers his own grave, they found an actual tombstone that appeared to be blank, and got permission to inscribe it with Ebenezer Scrooge. After filming, the grave was left as is, and remains to this day, 
here in St. Chad's Churchyard in Shrewsbury, England. Hear me, I, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this visitation. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Not long after movies started to be made, Christmas movies started to be made. The very first Christmas movie is believed to be this 1898 short film by pioneering British filmmaker George Albert Smith, which depicts Santa Claus coming down the chimney and delivering presents to the children. The film is notable not only for being the first Christmas movie, but also for innovating the picture-in-picture -picture effect. The man who portrayed Santa isn't credited, but it's believed by some to be the filmmaker himself. If that's true, that would make George Albert Smith the first person to play Santa Claus on film. After his death in 1959, Smith was cremated at the Downs Crematorium in Brighton, England. His ashes scattered on the grounds. There is no marker here, but there are plaques on the house where he lived and where his studio once was. A half century later, Hollywood would produce what would become the first great perennial Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life, in 1946. It's the story of George Bailey, who through the intervention of a guardian angel, decides he wants to live after being shown what a positive impact his life has really had on others. The film was not a major success in its day, but through annual holiday presentations on television, has become one of Hollywood's most beloved classics. The film was made by legendary director Frank Capra, who earned an Oscar nomination for the film. Capra was an Italian filmmaker, also known for films like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. After his death at age 94, he was laid to rest here in the Coachella Valley. It's a Wonderful Life stars Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey, a building and loan banker who is down on his luck during the holidays. Stewart was known for his American Everyman appeal, making him perfect for the role of George Bailey. The role earned him an Oscar nomination. That's a Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. Stewart is also known for films like Vertigo and Anatomy of a Murder. He was laid to rest here at Forest Lawn Glendale after his death at age 89. George Bailey's love interest and soon wife, Mary, was played by Donna Reed, who, like Jimmy, personified the American everywoman of the 1940s. Bed for 247, please. Is Daddy in trouble? Yes, Pete. Shall I pray for him? Yes, Jenny, pray very hard. Me too! In the 50s and 60s, she had her own television show, The Donna Reed Show, and in 1954, she won an Oscar for her role in From Here to Eternity. After her death, she was laid to rest here at Westwood Village Memorial Park. We head to the mausoleum at Calvary Cemetery in Los Angeles to find the miserly antagonist of It's a Wonderful Life. Mr. Potter, the unscrupulous banker, was played by Lionel Barrymore, a member of the Barrymore dynasty of actors in Hollywood. Oh, confounded man, are you afraid of success? I'm offering you a three years contract at $20,000 a year starting today. Is it a deal or isn't it? Barrymore is also remembered as Ebenezer Scrooge in annual radio performances of A Christmas Carol in the 30s to the 50s. He died in 1954 at the age of 76. As George contemplates suicide by jumping off a bridge, someone beats him to it, forcing George to dive in after him and save him. Turns out this was Clarence, George's guardian angel, who was working to get his wings. Henry Travers played the angel second class, who shows George what people's lives would have been like had he never been born. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Henry is laid to rest here in the great mausoleum at Forest Long Glendale. Thomas Mitchell played George Bailey's absent-minded Uncle Billy, who misplaces the building and loans cash deposit setting in motion the events that lead to George's downfall. We've got to find that money! I've no good deal. Uncle Billy, look, do you realize what's going to happen if we don't find it? 
Thomas Mitchell also played Kris Kringle in the 1955 television production of A Miracle on 34th Street. We're here at the Chapel of the Pines in Los Angeles. After his death in 1962, Mitchell was cremated here, his ashes stored in the crematory vault. Another legendary Christmas star also rests here, which brings us to our next perennial Christmas classic, Miracle on 34th Street. This time the original 1947 film version. Edmund Gwen is considered by many as the quintessential classic Hollywood Santa Claus. He played the role of Kris Kringle in Miracle on 34th Street and won an Oscar for his performance. Oh, Christmas isn't just a day, it's a frame of mind, and that's what's been changing. That's why I'm glad I'm here, maybe I can do something about it. After his death at age 81 in 1959, he too was cremated here, his ashes stored in the crematory vault. Chris Kringle was hired to play Santa at Macy's department store by Doris Walker, played by the legendary actress Maureen O'Hara. Doris is pragmatic in her approach to Christmas, raising her daughter Susan not to believe in fairy tales. By the end of the film, though, we get hints that even Doris begins to believe again in Santa Claus. Would you please tell her that you're not really Santa Claus? That there actually is no such person? Well, I'm sorry to disagree with you, Mrs. Walker, but not only is there such a person, but here I am to prove it. <laughs> Maureen O'Hara was also known for her roles as Western heroines often alongside John Wayne in films like The Quiet Man. She lived to the age of 95, making her one of the longest living stars from Hollywood's golden age. After her death, she was interred here at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Many know Natalie Wood for her roles in films like Rebel Without a Cause and West Side Story. But the breakout role came for young Natalie as an adorable eight-year-old playing Susan a young girl whose belief in Santa Claus is affirmed when she gets exactly what she asked for. Oh, you were right, Mommy. Mommy told me if things don't turn out just the way you want them to the first time, you still got to believe. And I kept believing, and you were right, Mommy. Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. Natalie was nominated for three Oscars in her career, a career that was cut short by a drowning accident off of Catalina Island in 1981, the events of which are still shrouded in mystery to this day. She rests here at Westwood Village Memorial Park. Animation has forged a very special place in Christmas entertainment, and the 60s and 70s were, in many ways, the golden age of Christmas animation. It was in this era that some of the most enduring and beloved animated specials were produced, including those iconic and oft-imitated stop-motion features. Rankin Bass was the production company behind many of these, their breakout hit being Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which first aired in 1964. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was the creation of Robert L. May. He was a copywriter for the Montgomery Ward department store, who requested a cheery Christmas story from him for their shoppers. May came up with the idea of a reindeer with a luminous nose who lights Santa's way, and the poem was released to the public as a booklet in 1939. Robert May, the father of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, lived to be 71 and is laid to rest here at St. Joseph Cemetery, just outside of Chicago. The story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer would also spawn a popular Christmas song written by May's brother-in-law, Johnny Marks. It was recorded by Gene Autry in 1949, becoming one of the most popular and best-selling Christmas songs of all time. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose. Gene Autry rests here at Forest Lawn in the Hollywood Hills. And that brings us back to the 1964 TV special, as well as back to Illinois and Mound Cemetery, where rests a man whose voice and music would become synonymous with the holidays, Burl Ives. He voiced Sam the Snowman, the narrator of the story of Rudolph. The singer and banjoist also performed many of the songs in the film, including a rendition of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The most famous reindeer of all. He was known for popularizing traditional folk songs, releasing dozens of albums in his career. And on the big screen, he's also seen in films like Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and The Big Country, which won him an Oscar. He died from cancer at age 85. Who are you? Who am I? The name's Yukon Cornelius. 
the greatest prospector in the North! Yukon Cornelius is indeed the greatest prospector in the North. So who better to get to voice Yukon Cornelius than an actor from the Great White North, Larry Mann. Yukon Cornelius joins Rudolph and Hermie the Elf on their journeys in his quest to find silver and gold. Larry Mann lived to be 91 and is laid to rest here at Eden Cemetery in the San Fernando Valley. And as for the voice of Rudolph, that was Canadian actress Billy Mae Richards. After her death in 2010, she was cremated, so we are unable to visit her. The next year, in 1965, audiences were first treated to what would become another annual holiday staple, a Charlie Brown Christmas. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown! This was the first television special produced about the Peanuts comic strip. I've killed it. And it wouldn't be the last. I never thought it was such a bad little tree. It's not bad at all, really. It was written by Charles Schultz, the man who created, wrote, and drew the beloved Peanuts comic strip from 1950 until his death in 2000. Peanuts is arguably the most popular, influential, and longest running comic strip in history. After his death at age 77, Schultz was laid to rest here in Pleasant Hills Cemetery in Sonoma County, California. You're the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem. Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. In 1957, Dr. Seuss put a delightfully Grinchy spin on Christmas with his book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Nine years later, in 1966, the story would be made into an animated TV film starring the legendary Boris Karloff as the narrator and the Grinch. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. Karloff is primarily known for his roles in horror films, most notably as Frankenstein's monster in the Universal Horror Films. So when it came to voicing the Grinch, Karloff was a perfect fit. After his death at age 81, Karloff was cremated, his ashes interred here under a rose bush at Guilford Crematorium in Surrey, England. As the Grinch goes about his unmerry way, stealing Christmas, he hears a sound like the coo of a dove. She stared at the Grinch and said, Sandy Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? The woman who voiced that little who was a woman considered by many as one of the greatest voice actresses ever, June Foray. In addition to Cindy Lou Who, June Foray was the voice of Rocky the Flying Squirrel, Lucifer in Disney's Cinderella, Jokey Smurf, Grandmother Fa in Mulan, and many, many more. Chuck Jones once said of her, June Foray is not the female Mel Blanc. Mel Blanc was the male June Foray. She lived to be 99 and is laid to rest here at Westwood Village Memorial Park in the Sanctuary of Tranquility. No holiday special would be complete without an iconic song, and You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, has become a wonderfully unconventional Christmas song since appearing in the film. To get that deep, grave vocal performance the song required, Hollywood called on its favorite bass singer, Thurl Ravenscroft. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. He's also known as the voice of Tony the Tiger and voicing characters at Disneyland, including a singing bust in the Haunted Mansion. He rests here in the Memorial Gardens at the Christ Cathedral in Orange County, California. There's a certain magic to the very first snow, especially when it falls on the day before Christmas. We've featured Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but there's another magical Christmas character we mustn't forget. Frosty the Snowman was a jolly happy soul. After the success of Gene Autry's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, songwriters Jack Rollins and Steve Nelson set out to create another seasonal hit for Autry, and thus Frosty was born in 1950. In 1969, Rankin Bass would produce an animated TV special, Frosty the Snowman, which featured as narrator the legendary actor and singer Jimmy Durante, whose gravelly performance of the song has become iconic. Durante rests here at Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City, California. Among the talents who lent their voices to Frosty the Snowman film was, once again, June Foray, who in 
who voiced Karen, the teacher, and various other voices. So you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Turning the page over to 1970, we remember another stop-motion classic, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, which was inspired by the song of the same name. The song was written by John Frederick Coots and Haven Gillespie, first performed on Eddie Cantor's show in 1934. Haven Gillespie was the lyricist of the song, and rests here in the Court of Remembrance at Forest Lawn in the Hollywood Hills. He was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1972. Classic Hollywood aficionados likely recognize the face and voice of that puppet that opens the 1970 film as the one and only Fred Astaire. The legendary actor, dancer, and singer played the narrator of the film. Well, hello there. Uh, my name's Special Delivery Kluger, SD for short. Oh, I've got lots of letters for Santa today. This wasn't Fred's only contribution to Holiday Fair. He played nine different roles in the 1979 movie, The Man in the Santa Claus Suit. After his death at age 88, he was laid to rest here at Oakwood Memorial Park in the San Fernando Valley, close to his sister Adele, and not far from his frequent on-screen dance partner, Ginger Rogers. Another screen legend was the voice of Kris Kringle, the man who would become Santa Claus. Mickey Rooney plays a young orphan boy who grows up to be a toy maker, delivering toys to children around the world on Christmas Eve, the night of profound love. Not call myself Kringle? What other name would suit me? There is one. You were wearing this when we found you as a baby. See what it says. Claus. Claus? Rooney lived to be 93 and now rests here at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. In the Great Mausoleum at Forest Lawn Glendale, we find the niche of Keenan Wynn, the actor known for films like Dr. Strangelove, voiced the Winter Warlock in Santa Claus is Coming to Town. How goes it, Mr. Warlock? Winter, please. I've got my magic power working just fine. I can cast up a big freeze, yes sir. I think I can guarantee a white Christmas. Keenan is inurned here with his father, the legendary Edwin, who played Kris Kringle in the 1959 TV version of Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sled! The next generation of Christmas classics came to us in the 80s. 1983 saw the release of A Christmas Story, based on the semi-autobiographical anecdotes of humorist Gene Shepard. Oh. Only I didn't say fudge. It was a sleeper hit that opened to moderate success, only to grow to cult classic status. No, no. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. The film is full of memorable characters, including Ralphie's old man, known for his incomprehensible expletive ramblings, and a love for his major award, the leg lamp. The role was played by Darren McGavin. You know what this is? This is a lamp. It was indeed a lamp. Isn't that great? What a great lamp. After his death in 2006 at the age of 83, McGavin was laid to rest here at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Another 80s film that will likely be hitting your television screens for Christmas is the 1985 film, Santa Claus the Movie. They're here. It starred David Huddleston, John Lithgow, and British funny man Dudley Moore as an ambitious elf named Patch. Oh my boys! I've seen some reindeer in my time and you're the best! The best! We did it! We did it! Ha, ha, ha. Moore is also known for the films Ten and Arthur, which earned him an Oscar nomination. After his death at age 66, he was laid to rest at Hillside Cemetery in New Jersey. Music has an uncanny power to conjure up emotions within us. That power doubly evident in holiday music. And one of Hollywood's brightest stars had a voice that could harness that magic better than just about anyone else, Judy Garland. We visited her several times in the past, and will certainly again. Outside of The Wizard of Oz, one of Judy Garland's best-known films is 1944's Meet Me in St. Louis. 
In that film, she introduced us to what would become another holiday classic. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Judy rests here at Hollywood Forever Cemetery in a pavilion that bears her name. At Westwood Village Memorial Park, we find a handful of musicians whose tunes always help us get into the Christmas spirit. This is Sammy Kahn, a four-time Oscar-winning songwriter who wrote a number of Christmas songs, perhaps most notably, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, which he wrote with Jules Stein in 1945. Not far from where Kahn is buried is one of the crooners who would perform his songs, including Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Dean Martin. And since we've no place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Dean Martin actually died on Christmas Day in 1995. The inscription here on his crypt is one of his signature tunes, Everybody Loves Somebody Sometime. Also here in this same cemetery we find the final resting place of the Velvet Fog, Mel Torme. He was not only a talented singer, but a songwriter as well. In 1945, he wrote The Christmas Song, which many people know as Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire The song was co-written with another talented songwriter, Robert Wells, whose niche is in this same cemetery in the Garden of Serenity. Wells later became a producer for television. With the rise of rock and roll in the 1950s, it was inevitable that someone would make Christmas music that rocks. If you put jingle bells and rock around the clock into a blender, you'd get the 1957 Bobby Helms hit, Jingle Bell Rock. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bells swing and jingle bells ring. Mr. Jingle Bell Rock now rests here in Hilldale Cemetery in Indiana. Speaking of Jingle Bells, let's pay a visit to the man who wrote that song. To do so, we head south to Savannah, Georgia, and Laurel Grove Cemetery. Jingle Bells is one of the best known and commonly sung American songs in the world, and it was written by this man, James Lord Pierpont. It was initially published in 1857 under the title One Horse Open Sleigh, and while not written explicitly for Christmas, has since become one of the signature tunes of the holiday. And for those of you who can read music, you probably noticed the notes here on his marker are the opening lines of Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells is old, but it's not the oldest Christmas song, not by a century or more. We're back in London at Westminster Abbey. Here lies Baroque composer George Frederick Handel. One of the best known Christmas carols today is Joy to the World. The words to the hymn were written by Isaac Watts in 1719, and the tune we know today borrowed lines from Handel's Messiah, arranged by Lowell Mason in the mid-19th century. Handel wrote the Messiah in 1741, and it too is often performed around Christmas time, concluding with the rousing Hallelujah Chorus. Classic crooners like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra often performed and released Christmas music. But perhaps no singular voice has come to embody the warm nostalgia of the holidays more than that of Bing Crosby, who rests here at Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City, California. In the 1942 film Holiday Inn, Bing Crosby sang a new Christmas song that beautifully captures the sweet sentimentality and nostalgia of Christmas time, White Christmas. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas the song would become a hit, particularly with war-weary servicemen overseas, whose spirits were buoyed by the comforting reminders of home. Crosby's White Christmas would become the best-selling single of all time, and is considered the number two song of the century after Judy Garland's Over the Rainbow. White Christmas was written by a man considered one of America's greatest songwriters, Irving Berlin, who rests here at Woodlawn in New York. The song was written for the 1942 film Holiday Inn, and would win Irving an Oscar. It's generally considered the most popular secular Christmas song ever. The bittersweet tone of the song perhaps reflects the Berlin family's sentiments around Christmas time. Their son, Irving Berlin Jr., 
died on Christmas Day in 1928. He was just 24 days old. He's buried here next to his father. Another Christmas classic was penned by Berlin for the film Holiday Inn, Happy Holidays. He would pen over a thousand songs in his life, a life that lasted just over a century. And among all those songs, White Christmas is perhaps his very best. And that concludes our tour. We barely skimmed the surface of all there is to remember. So be sure to let us know in the comments what stars top your Christmas tree this holiday season. To our enormous extended Hollywood Graveyard family around the world. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. So who was that random dude that came up to me in the opening sequence? Why, that was our very own Giuseppe Vasapoli, composer of the Hollywood Graveyard music. He was in town for a visit from Italy, so of course we had to squeeze in a Christmas cameo. 